So I'm super excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, it's always fun to get to introduce somebody that, you've, uh, that has been a big influence on you, and Kate has been an incredibly large influence on me uh, since I knew her at UCLA. It's been about 10 years now. Um, in any event, uh, Catherine Hales is the James B. Duke Professor of Literature at Duke University. She works at the intersection of literature, science, and technology in the context of the 20th and 21st centuries. She's the author of 10 books and too many scholarly articles to count. Her 1999 book, How We Became Post-Human, won that year's Rene Wellick Prize for the best book of literary theory. And Writing Machines, published in 2002, won the Suzanne Langer Award for Outstanding Scholarship. The students in the room can take this as, you know, some of the, actually, there were some students this morning asking me for what to read over break. That'd be a good start. Um, she's the recipient of a slew of other awards and honors, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Endowments for the Humanities Fellowships, a Presidential Research Fellowship at the University of California. The list goes on and on. Suffice it to say that Kate is a big deal, both in her home field of literature and across cultural studies. Now, she also comes from uh, outside, but not that far outside architecture. And so for the architects who might be less familiar with world-class achievements in the humanities, think of Kate as, some, as something like the Rainer Bannum of literary criticism. Um, like Bannum, Kate began her professional career in the sciences. She earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Rochester Institute of Technology and a master's from Caltech. Later, she worked as a research chemist at Xerox and as a chemical research consultant. Also like Bannum, she left that promising career in science and shifted her interest toward the humanities. She soon collected an additional MA and a PhD in English literature uh, from Michigan State and the University of Rochester, respectively. After that, she began cranking out hugely influential books and scholarly articles that, like Bannum's, probed the largely uncharted no man's land between science and the humanities. Her early books, like The Cosmic Web, Chaos Bound, and Chaos in Order, made the intricacies of mathematical field models and chaos theory not only comprehensible but also, and I think more importantly, productive for literary scholars. Later, her interest shifted, uh, or shifted toward questions of information, embodiment, materiality, subjectivity, and both human and non-human cognition in books like How We Became Post-Human, My Mother Was a Computer, How We Think, and her forthcoming, and the title has changed since I wrote this, you are more than you think, the power of the cognitive non-conscious, due out sometime next year. In addition, Kate has long been known as an important voice in science fiction scholarship and literally wrote the book on electronic literature. She's written influential essays on novelists as diverse as Neal Stephenson, Shelley Jackson, Philip K. Dick, David Foster Wallace, Mark Danielewski, just to name a few. I could go on, but instead I wanted to very quickly recount a more personal story about Kate before I turn the podium over. Uh, as I said, I met Kate at UCLA. Uh, at the time, I was on my own second tour through graduate school. Uh, this was about 10 years ago. And on a whim, in my first year, I enrolled in a course in the English department called Big Books. Uh, Kate taught that course, and I only later learned that it was thought of as something of a rite of passage for English PhDs. I'm not sure if they told you this, but they definitely told me this. Uh, in the course of that class, we read Nabokov's Pale Fire, Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, Danielewski's House of Leaves, and David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest, all in a single 10-week quarter. If you're unfamiliar with those titles, they comprise together 2,863 pages. Uh, and page count is probably not the best way to account for the kinds of demands and the kinds of pleasures that they make on and provide to their readers. Uh, in any event, somewhere along the mind-bending arc of Gravity's Rainbow, Kate said something that stuck with me ever since. Every once in a while, she said, you'll encounter a book that has the capacity to change you profoundly and irreversibly. Gravity's Rainbow is one of those books. After you read it, she said, you won't be the same person you were before you started. She was right about that. Reading books like that changes you. It certainly changed me. But it's safe to say that I'd have a much clumsier idea of the nature of that change were it not for the incredible teacher that guided us through that 10-week odyssey. 
Kate is on equally sure footing accounting for such changes as the one I experienced in terms of the synaptogenetic reconfiguration of neural connections in the brain as she is in accounting for them in terms of the theoretical and ideological implications of the Western literary canon. Looking back and with all due respect to Thomas Pynchon, I'd say that it wasn't Gravity's Rainbow, but rather reading it and those other titles with Kate that accounted for some of the more profound changes I experienced in my time studying at UCLA. There are very few teachers who are capable of the impact and range that Kate routinely exhibits in the classroom. Rainer Banham, the engineer turned architectural historian, was one of them, and he was widely regarded as one of the most important teachers of his generation. Kate Hales, the chemist turned literary theorist, is another, and on top of all of her other accolades, she's rightly regarded as one of today's great teachers. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome her here tonight, so please join me in clapping. Kate. Well, I'd like to thank Todd for that gracious and lovely introduction and to the entire SIAR community for welcoming me here to give a talk to you tonight. So I'd like to think about our time together this evening as not so much a lecture, but a conversation. I'm going to present you with some ideas that I'm just finishing writing up now in my new book, uh, but there's, there are many, many implications to these ideas in different fields, and one of those fields is architecture. And I don't really have the expertise or the uh, street creds to pursue them in architecture, so I'm hoping that once I lay these ideas out for you, they'll stimulate you to think with me uh, on what these implications for architecture might be. So without further ado, let me get started. So I've entitled this talk, Rethinking the Mind of Architecture, which is a rather ambitious title and I can only accomplish this with your help. But uh, let me just quickly refer to what surely now is a cliche in architectural uh, circles, and that is that there's a deep correlation between the kind of values um, and cultural perspectives that are incorporated into built buildings uh, with the whole idea of what the ideal mind is like. So we are here we have the Greek uh, building of the Acropolis, and of course we're all familiar with its attributes, symmetry, rationality, and this goes along with the image of what an ideal human mind might be like. Or for another example, the Colosseum, and here we might think of a projection of imperial power and all of the attributes associated with that in, Ro in classical Roman culture or the Palace of Versailles after its remake expressing the bro uh, Baroque interest in sensitivity, passion, and affectivity, or the Gary Building in Prague where clearly the idea of deconstruction and building without foundations or doing without foundations results in this kind of structure. So my question is then, if we arrive at a new theory of mind, does that imply a new architecture? So you have here the title of my new book, You Are More Than You Think, and I'll just parse that for a moment for us. So thinking in my terminology means the sort of thoughts and ideas that go through our conscious mind. So by proclaiming you are more than you think, I'm pointing to cognitive activities that go on outside of consciousness. One of the major focuses for this is, and I'll repeat this phrase because it's easy to get tripped up on it, non-conscious cognition. Not unconscious, but non-conscious cognition. And so in the um, 
person are personified with a definite article, it becomes the power of the cognitive non-conscious. And I'll be talking tonight about some of the research in cognitive science and neuroscience that demonstrates a level of neuronal processing inaccessible to consciousness and yet absolutely essential for consciousness to function, and that is the cognitive non-conscious. So almost everyone, every scientist who writes about consciousness distinguishes at least two levels of consciousness. The first level is called core or primary consciousness, and this version of consciousness is widely shared not only in humans and primates, but mammals and also some aquatic species like octopi. Built on top of core consciousness is higher consciousness, which includes the attributes of abstract reasoning, the ability to reflect on the self as the self, the creation and manipulation of symbols, and so forth. Increasingly, there is a challenge to the idea that these attributes are uniquely human, although I think it's undeniable that although some primate species also uh, also possess them, humans have them in greater uh, degree and more depth than any other species. So it's almost certain that higher consciousness built on and took advantage of core consciousness. If you look at where these faculties are located, you can read a kind of evolutionary scenario here. The brain stem repeats some of the cognitive capacities of reptiles. On top of the brain stem comes uh, the midbrain, and the midbrain is the site of core conscious functionalities, and then the neocortex associated with higher consciousness. So we get a kind of evolutionary scenario of how consciousness developed. Antonio Damasio, a neuroscientist, uh, writes about a level of neuronal functioning that he calls the proto-cell and that I call the cognitive non-conscious. Importantly, the cognitive non-conscious is distinguished from the unconscious because no amount of introspection will make it available to consciousness. It has the capability for sophisticated pattern recognition, patterns too dense with information and too chaotic for consciousness to make any sense out of, and yet experiments have demonstrated that non-conscious cognition can in fact discern these patterns and learn from them. Non-conscious cognition is capable of learning, and I, as I've just uh, illustrated, capable of drawing inferences, and it influences behavior. So along with Damasio, a, a person who has written importantly on this topic, is Gerald Edelman and uh, his uh, collaborator, Tonino. Um, and according to Edelman, uh, he makes a, a good match with Damasio because Damasio typically starts with um, higher brain formations and works down. Edelman, Edelman works at the neuronal level and goes on up. And so he uh, starts from the neuronal cell. The neuronal cells form synaptic clusters uh, which are capable of building maps. Scenes are built out of these maps and then primary consciousness are built out of scenes. So where cognitive non-conscious occurs is at the level of maps, scenes, and uh, neuronal or synaptic clusters. So now let's turn to the idea of the self, surely one of the most provocative and controversial topics in neurology. And here I'd like to refer to the work of Thomas Metzinger, a contemporary German philosopher. Metziger, in his book, Being No One, makes the controversial claim on the very first page, nobody ever had or was a self. So as soon as we start getting into how these neuronal processes uh, interact and work together, 
uh, one begins to wonder where is the location of the self. Typically, the self is identified with consciousness, but introspection will show that uh, the objects and the uh, thoughts of consciousness are fleeting and uh, transient. And so what constitutes the self? Well, Metzinger's claim is that consciousness has the ability to create the illusion of a self through two primary mechanisms. The first mechanism is what he calls the phenomenal self-model. That is that because higher consciousness has the ability to reflect on the self as a self, it builds a model of the self and mistakes that model for an actually existing reality. Going along with that is the ability of consciousness to build a phenomenal model of the intentionality relation. That's a big, unwieldy phrase, but basically what it means is that consciousness can build models of objects and entities in its environment with whom it is able to uh, build a relationship. Metziger's claim is that these models are transparent to the self. The self does not exist, only dynamic processes. So I might just here comment on how similar these ideas are to uh, meditative practices. So out of Zen Buddhism, for example, we get practices which are meant to reveal precisely the illusory nature of the self. And they do that by focusing on body uh, processes such as breathing. The closer one gets to breathing, one might say, the, the more remote one gets from consciousness and therefore the closer to cognitive non-conscious. If you have higher consciousness, such as humans do, then the self becomes reified even more strongly. So for centuries, or maybe millennial, uh, millennia, human beings have congratulated themselves on the species that has the most distinct form of consciousness. And it's only been relatively recently that people have started to think about the costs of consciousness, not just the benefits of consciousness, but the costs of consciousness. And this is a kind of parallel dynamic with the rise of the cognitive non-conscious. The more uh, people realize the essential functions performed by non-conscious cognition, the more doubts they have about the efficacy of consciousness. So Damasio, for example, in this quote, says that consciousness is primarily about the individual, about the self. And of course, this idea has been the subject of a very broad-based program to decenter the human, decenter the human emphasis on the self and the individual, including with fields like animal studies, environmental studies, and a host of other agendas now underway. So one of the costs of consciousness in this view then is the reification of the self that goes along with higher consciousness. But there are other costs as well. It's slow relative to perception. So after an initiating event happens, a full half second passes before consciousness begins its uptake. Now, a half second may not sound like very much time, 500 milliseconds, but in this age of um, sophisticated media, we have developed media forms that can intervene in human experience before consciousness comes online. For example, in the field of affective capitalism, so-called because it develops stimuli that uh, hit the human sensorium before consciousness appears and sort of begin to pre-influence consciousness, for example, toward brand recognition or brand names. So it's slow relative to perception. It also has a very limited processing ability. As I mentioned, if it encounters very sophisticated patterns or partially obscured patterns, it's unable to make them out whereas non-conscious cognition can do so. 
and perhaps most importantly, consciousness more or less continuously confabulates. This uh, phenomenon is well documented in the research literature. You may have seen that online video about a uh, psychological experiment in which the subjects were asked to keep track of how many passes basketball players make in a given interval of time. In the middle of the video, someone in a gorilla suit walks across the courtyard. And subjects were asked later, how many passes did you see? Oh, I saw 11 passes. Did you see anything unusual? About 80% of the people will respond, no. No, I didn't see anything unusual. Or I'll give you another example. Someone stops a person on the street and begins to ask directions. And after the direction giver has started to speak, two workmen carry a sheet of vertical wood between them. And when the wood pass and the workman passes, the interlocutor has changed. It's no longer the person who started asking directions in the first place. About 80% of the people will just go on talking as if they don't notice that this is a different person. Or here's another example. Subject stops a young man on the street, shows him a composite picture of four women, and asks the young man, can you tell me which of these four women you find most attractive? So the young man indicates one of the four. The researcher takes the composite back, chit-chats for a couple of minutes, then hands it back to the young man, points to a different woman than he chose in the first place, and says, now, what about this woman struck you as particularly attractive? About 80% of the respondents will then continue on to say exactly what this woman's charms were that the other women lacked. So in other words, consciousness is dedicated to maintaining worldly coherence. When things that are strange or bizarre happens, consciousness tends to simply edit them out, which is why eyewitness testimony is so notoriously unreliable. So we can say that insisting on worldly coherence is a strongly adaptive trait. We can think of all kinds of ways in which that ability has adaptive value. But it also has a cost, and the cost is to partially screen from us things in the world that are bizarre, surprising, or unusual. But those things are noticed in non-conscious cognition. OK, here's a cognitive timeline, which just shows in very rough sketch uh, what the cognitive timeline looks like. So, uh, somewhere around 100 milliseconds, sensation and perceptions begin from uh, bodily stimuli. Non-conscious cognition begins to process this information around 200 milliseconds. Consciousness doesn't start processing until 500 milliseconds. Compare this with the fact that automated trading algorithms now trade in the region of 3 to 5 milliseconds. And so what we have now are, is a very belated consciousness trying to deal with a world in which media are processing that information very, very much more faster than consciousness is capable of. So this is just a quote from Edelman where he makes the point about uh, coherence. Many neuro neuropsychological disorders demonstrate that consciousness can bend or shrink and at times even split, but it does not tolerate breaks in coherence. So now if we compare the costs of consciousness with non-conscious cognition in humans, these are the qualities that non-conscious cognition possesses that consciousness does not. It's energy efficient. When consciousness is working hard, the brain is uptaking enormous amounts of glucose. That consciousness is, as people like to say, a glucose hog. By the time uh, these actions become habitual and sink into non-conscious cognition, uh, the whole operation of the brain becomes much more energy efficient. 
Non-conscious cognition has a fast processing speed, and therefore it keeps consciousness from being overwhelmed because it can either make the results of its processes accessible to consciousness or equally important, if the context is not relevant, suppressing this information. If for some reason everyone in this room lost their non-conscious cognition at this instant, within minutes consciousness would become psychotic because it simply would not be able to deal with the flood of information coming from the body and from external stimuli. Well, I've been throwing around the word cognition rather freely, so perhaps now is a good time to offer you my definition of cognition. So what I'm looking for in defining cognition is something that has a low threshold and yet is capable of scaling up into much more sophisticated operations. So here it is, cognition is a process, so it's not an attribute like intelligence, it's a process that interprets information in contexts that connect it with meaning. Now, when Shannon developed information theory, he deliberately divorced information from context because he knew that when you add in context, information becomes impossible to quantify. But if you connect it with context, processing information can then give you meaning. So context is the bridge between information and meaning. And this means then that the meanings that are derived or that are created through this process are context specific and multi leveled. So, if you have interpretation, you must have choice. If there's no choice, if there's only one option, interpretation can't operate. So, interpretation requires a choice. Now I'm going to make a claim that may seem controversial, but I think it becomes less controversial when you think about it. All biological life forms have some cognitive capacity. And I'm not talking here only about mammals. I'm talking about nematode worms and plants as also having some cognitive capacities. Now if you go back to that definition of cognition as interpreting information, a plant certainly interprets information. It reacts to the angle of the sun. It reacts to the chemical composition of the water that it's uptaking and so forth. So in my view, all biological life forms have some cognitive capacity. Going back to that definition again, that means that meaning making occurs at multiple levels, not only at the high level of something like abstract reasoning, but meaning making might be as simple as a unicellular organism deciding to admit a chemical or to use its membrane to avoid that chemical. That's a choice, that's a decision, it um, includes interpretation, and in the context of a unicellular organism, it creates meaning. Now, I said that one of my criteria for a definition of cognition is that it be able to scale up to more and more sophisticated cognitions. Let's take the example of a computer program. At the most fundamental level of alternating voltages, it makes a decision about whether uh, the five volts is a one or a zero. But from that fundamental basis, it can scale up into more and more sophisticated cognitions as uh, those different levels begin to interact in a recursive way. So this means then that I'm thinking of cognition as a spectrum. There's high cognition associated with higher consciousness, mid-cognition, such as interpreting ambiguous information, reaching conclusions, and then low cognition, recognizing patterns and drawing inferences, and non-conscious cognition sort of bridges low and mid-cognition. <clears throat> 
So this leads me then to propose a tripartite framework. And again, some people will find this controversial, but I think it fits with what I've said before. At the top of the pyramid is consciousness and unconsciousness, which I'm grouping together as modes of awareness. In the broad middle comes cognitive non-conscious processes. And at the bottom come material processes. So what do I mean by material processes? Something like a sandstorm, a blizzard, a glacier inching downhill. The crucial criterion that separates material processes from cognitive processes is the element of choice. A tornado cannot make a choice to plow through a village, plow through a field rather than a town, for example. And in, in general, material processes can be understood as the sum total of the forces acting on them, not as cognizers who can make choices, perform interpretations, and therefore create meaning. So one of the important things for me that this definition of cognition enables is to build a bridge between biological and technical cognition. Even scientists who emphasize that all biological life forms have some cognitive capabilities, such as the emerging field of cognitive biology, miss the opportunity to see that once you have this definition of cognition, it applies to technical systems, not only to biological systems. So it's no accident that many of the activities com com computational media perform duplicate the activities of non-conscious cognition, including recognizing and analyzing patterns, drawing inferences, interpreting ambiguous or conflicting information, and perhaps most importantly, keeping consciousness from being overwhelmed. If consciousness alone had to deal with all the streams of data circling the globe every microsecond, it would be an impossible task. That's why we have comp computational media, um, data banks, and so forth for. So it's interesting to me that it's the functions of non-conscious cognition which are largely duplicated in computational media, not the operations of consciousness. So cognitive science has been dominated by what's called the cognitivist paradigm for the last 20 years or so, which regards consciousness as merely the manipulation of formal symbols. I'm not at all persuaded by that paradigm. I much favor an embodied and uh, embedded notion of how consciousness works. But if we talk about non-conscious cognition, there's actually a much closer parallel with what computers do, although still profound differences in, in embodiment. So as we know, computational media are spreading into every other technology of any sophistication at all on the planet. In fact, you cannot think of a sophisticated technological system that does not incorporate some components of computational media. Transportation, air travel, um, sanitation facilities, water purification treatment plants. Every technology that's important to human life now has computational media as a part of it. So we can draw an analogy here. We can say that if we ask why humans have become dominant in their ecological niche, it's not because they're the fastest species. Humans are not the strongest species. They're not the biggest species. But what has enabled the human planetary dominance is their cognitive capabilities. Now we have a technology that also has cognitive capabilities, namely computational media. Computational media are not the most important to human life. You could argue sanitation is more important. It's not the most transformative. You could argue transportation is the most transformative. But it has the strongest evolutionary potential of any existing technology, and that's because of its cognitive capabilities. So this suggests there's a specific uh, 
alliance between the uh, dominant cognizers, humans, and computational media, the technology with the most extensive cognitive capabilities. So here's just a few facts to kind of make this argument less abstract. Cisco estimates that by 2016, there will be 24 billion devices connected to the internet. The present human population of the planet is 7.2 billion. And the further we go out in time, the more the population of things connected to the internet will continue to expand exponentially while humans will expand only very slowly. This suggests that cognitive technical devices are becoming more and more important in human complex systems. And in fact, they interpenetrate human and technical uh, systems. So because of the processing speed, et cetera, most communication now is between things. That's absolutely required by the infrastructure of informational technologies. If they were limited to humans, uh, they simply could not go at the speed or the density they do. That means human attention is the scarce commodity. Human attention is at the top of the communication pyramid, but increasingly, technical systems are being built so they have their own regions of autonomy outside human operation, as in the example of trading algorithms. So, I have a couple of slides about implications for the humanities, and then I'm going to speculate on some implications for architecture. So the idea that non-conscious cognition occurs everywhere in the biological world means that the humanities can no longer be content with being human-centered. If they're concerned with cognition and meaning, they have to in, take into account other life forms as well. It means that interpretations happen not only in higher consciousness, but uh, all across the board, including at very simple levels, and therefore meaning making, which is intrinsic to the humanities and primary to all of the humanities, uh, occurs in multiple and diverse contexts. So, <clears throat> Then for the humanist, it will be necessary to expand the boundaries of what we mean when we talk about meaning making. It'll be necessary to recognize that technical systems affect human behaviors consciously, unconsciously, and non-consciously. And I'll just give as a quick example of this, the research that's been done showing that surfing on the web actually has neurological consequences and begins to arrange the synaptic networks of the people who do it. The younger they are, the more, those, the more pronounced those effects are. And then the fact that technical systems interpenetrate complex social systems, I think is pervasive for nearly every discipline, including the humanities and architecture. So what does this mean for the humanities? Well, on the one hand, it opens up possible collaborations with scientists, engineers, social scientists, because if the humanities' special province is to deal with meaning and interpretation, once those terms are seen to apply to technical as well as human systems, hum humanists have the possibility of making important contributions. Um, and it means that meaning making extends, as I've said, to technical systems as well. Okay, implications for architecture, and here I'll really hope that you can expand on this with me. Decentering of the human, that's a very broad cultural agenda at present, uh, dominating a lot of fields, animal studies, environmental studies, and so forth. The emphasis on choice, interpretation, and meaning, recognizing cognition as pervading biological life forms and technical systems, and then the interpenetration of technical and human assemblages. So let me give you a couple of specific architectural examples. 
This is the cover from Peter Watts' science fiction novel called Blindsight. Blindsight is a, a recognized neurological phenomenon where someone has, has uh, received a trauma in the uh, visual cortex that prevents the visual cortex from being able to communicate to consciousness. But nevertheless, that information is getting into the system somehow, although consciousness is not aware of it. So for example, if you ask someone who suffers from blindsight, what is that, and the left uh, hemisphere is uh, affected, and you ask, what is that picture on the right? Well, the person can't see the picture on the right, although the sensory perceptions are coming into the brain. Uh, so the person will say, there's no picture on the right. And so then the researcher persists and said, well, if there were a picture on the right, what do you speculate it might be about? And put that way, the subject will say, well, I think it might be a sunflower. And then, of course, it is a sunflower. So somehow that information is coming through, although consciousness blocks it because of the, because of the lesion. So in blind sight, Watts imagines that humans encounter an alien species. And they realize that this alien species has a technology far superior to Earth technology. But they're utterly mystified by the aliens themselves. And slowly, spoiler alert, they come to suspect that this is a species which has never developed consciousness. They operate entirely through non-conscious cognition. And Watts has a lot of fun imagining how you could develop a highly sophisticated technology without consciousness. But at the end of his novel, his protagonist begins to speculate that Earth may be an anomaly in the cosmic uh, planetary, the cosmic cognitive ecology. That on Earth, a local maximum was achieved through the development of consciousness. So you'll remember that the problem with a local maximum is once you arrive at a local maximum on a fitness landscape, you can never get off of it because the only way you can get to the higher global maximum over there is by going downhill, which is to say becoming less fit. So he hypothesizes that on Earth, consciousness evolved and represented a local maximum, but elsewhere in the cosmos, there's a higher global maximum that does not use consciousness and therefore does not incur all the costs that consciousness occurs, incurs, and that's the case with the, uh, with the aliens. So we get a verbal description of what the architecture of their ship looks like. This is an artist's rendering of it, and uh, I'll be interested as architects what you make of this structure, but I have some other suggestions. This is an image from Marcus Novak's uh, works. So those of you who know Novak's architecture will know that he designs uh, multi-dimensional uh, structures of five, six, or even seven dimensions. And then he takes a cut through them to be able to represent them in three dimensions. And this is one of the cuts. It seems to me that it bears some resemblance to that cover of the novel. Here's another image of the same kind. Here's a final one. And what these share, I think, is that it's very difficult to make any sense of these patterns consciously. And yet, if non-conscious cognition can work on them and discern patterns too complex for consciousness, it may be that non-conscious cognition can actually make sense of and process these forms. So with that, I'll conclude and invite whatever questions and responses you may have. Thank you.